You are listening to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. One of the greatest limitations Keith and I have when making this podcast is our inability to deeply discuss music, keys, scales, instrument performance, time signatures, and more. We do our best, of course, but oftentimes we are limited to predictable and generic analysis such as, that riff is amazing, and stuff like that. Two of my favorite pieces of music by Propagandy are Night Letters and Note to Self, both of which we have covered relatively recently on this podcast. These two track ones are pretty special in my view, but I lack the musical minutia language to fully explain what I like about them. Over the past couple of years, we've had some amazing musicians on to explain how they see Propagandi's work as special from a musical perspective, and this is one of those episodes. My guest on this episode is Stephen Yerushi. Stephen is a longtime friend of the podcast, and he got involved when he made the unbelievably impressive Night Letters cover featured in episode 69. Stephen and I met up and went to three propaganda shows together in Toronto, London, and Guelph, Ontario in May 2022, and we decided to do an episode together talking about his Night Letters cover, and we decided that it would be awesome for him to do another cover which wound up being Note to Self, and we'd turn it into a sort of track one special bonus episode. The focus of this episode is the music of Propagandy. This episode is a deep dive into the performance of Night Letters and Note to Self told by someone who understands music in a way that I, frankly, don't. Stephen's cover of Night Letters is included again in full in this episode, and a brand new and otherwise unreleased cover of Note to Self is also included in the episode, and it's amazing. I really hope that you love it. So time stamps for the covers are in the show notes of this episode. This episode is for people that want to understand the technical behind what Propagandy does in Night Letters and Note to Self. So thank you for joining us, and I really hope that you enjoy this conversation with Stephen Yerushi on Night Letters and Note to Self. Okay, well, Stephen, why don't you go ahead and spend a moment and introduce yourself to the audience just a little bit so they know kind of about who you are and what you do. Um, So, yeah, I'm Stephen. Uh, I I did the cover on the Night Letters episode, um, Mm -hmm. and uh, I've been in bands, uh, geez, since high school um, and Mm -hmm. ever since. I pretty much haven't stopped playing. like I said, I think in that Night Letters episode, um, bass is my trade and everything else kind of came after out of necessity or otherwise. And um, yeah, I just really love um, not only music in general, but playing it, analyzing it, and uh, just getting to the nitty gritty of things. Um, I mm-hmm. think that's just kind of a big curiosity of mine, just just figuring out how everything works. And uh, music is no exception. Wonderful. Well, I was thinking the other day, as I was planning for this, how did Steven and I originally get in touch? So I went back into our email and I searched for you and I found that you wrote me just the nicest email in October of 2020, which is, it's, it's shocking now how long ago that was. It's, it's alarming. Um, but in that email, you wrote to me some wonderful things about Umberto Eco's essay. Um, I believe it's Ur Fascism. And uh, you also wrote to me about Dear Coach's Corner and more and just some wonderful sentiments about the podcast in general. And I was wondering what kind of like if you remember doing this, like what inspired you to reach out? And because it's been such a long journey of like chatting and hanging with you ever since then. Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember um, 
in those dark times, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they were um, exceptionally dark for me. Uh, you know, I can only speak from my experience, but it wasn't the best time of my life. And, uh, yeah. you know, I got into, I couldn't really listen to music. Um, it was just, it, it didn't fit my mood uh, and I just wasn't parsing it. So I ended up just branching into podcasts, you know. I had already been um, listening to Chris's Patreon for some time. And uh, I said, okay, let's try some stuff out. Stumbled upon you know, you guys, you, um, you and Keith, and the rest is history. You guys hooked me right away. And um, I just had to, you know, thank you for giving me something to do on my long drives for work, because um, without the music, it was crushingly empty. Mm. Um, and and that's really what was the, the uh, origination for me just sending you that email. I was just really thankful. Yeah. Well, I mean, and ever since then i mean you and i have kept in really regular contact for the last i don't know i guess 18 months or so at this point and it sort of culminated for me just a couple of weeks ago on the may of 2022 propaganda eastern canada tour where you and i got to go to a couple of shows together um in toronto and london ontario and guelph so it's i feel like you and i have almost had a sort of bangers embrace experience in a way you know what i mean yeah it definitely um you know felt like that as um you know the week went on i mean it, my uh, my friends and I were jokingly calling it my my hell week where basically <laughs> i would have to you know go out to a prop show and then go to work the next day and then another prop show and it was like uh, just nonstop. I wasn't even sure if I was going to make all four of those kind of Southern Ontario shows, like the yeah. double hitter at, at Toronto and stuff. But um, then serendipitously, my boss just sent me to work in London that day. And um, I just showed up to that show as well. It was it was a really nice experience, you know, just um, especially after kind of COVID and no, no shows um, in Toronto. It's I'm just taking every chance that I can get to see people and music that I enjoy. And uh, you and Propagandi are no exception. Well, and I got to tell you, man. Um, so as you know, this past October in 2021, I went to those three Propagandi shows at the Park Theater in Winnipeg. And then when these shows got announced in Southern Ontario, I, I compared it to like my parenting schedule. And I was like, I, I fit in all the shows that were like on my off days of parenting. And I'm whenever I go to shows like this for propaganda, I am operating under the assumption that something will go wrong, that the show will get canceled, and that it won't work out. So, which we did see, you know, the Regina and the Saskatoon shows got canceled. So I was like operating under the assumption that like the tour wouldn't happen, or maybe I would see one show and not three, but then I saw all three and I saw all three in October in Winnipeg. And I have no regrets about that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I wasn't tired of it at the end of the third night. I was just like, this is a something that I have to cherish now because it has totally reframed the way I appreciate live music. And if I have a chance to see propaganda, I'm going to do it because, like, I feel like every time I see them, I'm like, what if this is the last time, you know? Yeah, totally. It's the same idea. I mean, I remember back when uh, Rush... Um, my yep. favorite band of all time um, will um, they did the R40 tour came I by went. in Toronto. Yeah. yeah. And um, that when they came by, they did a, a double header in Toronto hometown. And um, the first night I went and I was like, great, this is fantastic. It's so good to see the boys again. And then I just picked up tickets for the second night. I couldn't help it. And I'm so glad because I mean, um, Neil Peart's passing was just uh, an absolute gut punch. The most unreal pain I felt uh, at this kind of loss of a kind of artist or celebrity in my life. And uh, I am so grateful I got to see um, him and the rest of them uh, play uh, as often as possible because they're just, it's just, you, you can't buy that once it's gone. Yeah. You can't take, you can't take this stuff for granted. Um, and so like now I've seen propaganda in three Canadian provinces, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, so, you know, I'm just thinking about this in a new way. Like I've seen two propaganda shows in St. Louis, one in Saskatoon, 
one in London, England, and then three in Winnipeg, and then three in Southern Ontario. So I, I'm just like adding up like, like, you know, these shows that I can, and I'm just trying to appreciate it for what it is. But I'm curious now about your thoughts on the shows. Uh, did you have a favorite night? Did you have any specific feelings about any of the shows in particular that linger with you that you'd like to share with uh, listeners out there who maybe couldn't go to these shows that you and I were so fortunate to see? I mean, the Lee's Palace shows were fantastic. Toronto can't get enough of prop. They're sellout every night. I mean, you saw that was yeah probably overpacked that packed. room. So and so um packed. and uh it's just a fantastic venue with great sound and everyone can see because of the strange pit operation they have going on. Yeah. It's um it's just a fantastic venue that I've never had a bad gig at that I've seen. Um, so that's my feelings on that. Um, the openers were fantastic. Um, a friend of mine always says that, um, he'll come to any prop tour that comes around for one night, not really for prop, but because they always have fantastic opening bands. I mean, we discovered war on women reviver, um, Jan Fiorentino opened back, um, on the failed States tour for the only Toronto date, but nonetheless, and we've just seen fantastic, fantastic openers. They know how to pick them. Yeah. Um, and, and I, got to, I mean, I got to meet, I got to meet Jen Fiorentino at that Lee's show. So that was really cool. So yeah. Past guests of the podcast. I was like, Hey, it's Jen Fiorentino. And she's like, Oh, hi. And I was like, so we got to chat for a few minutes and that was wonderful. How many like people that are, uh, tangentially connected to the podcast in some way, how many of them were at one or one or all of these shows, you know? Yeah. It was, it was funny just kind of hanging with you in between sets or, or before sets and stuff like that. And just someone would come up and be like tall guy. You, Greg? (laughs) Yep, that's me. Podcast guy? Podcast guy? Podcast guy, yeah. And uh, it was it was really nice that that kind of community we kind of you know experienced at all the shows. Um, I mean, you especially, but just just going out and seeing people enjoy music, especially you know that we all enjoy. It was really energizing. I felt more energized that week, doing so much more you know, than I had ever since COVID started. And it, I was not tired in the slightest. It, yeah. it really goes to show how much doing the things you're passionate about um, or that you enjoy um, cannot be taken for granted because um, the grind is the grind for a reason. And the rest is actually what ends up recharging you a lot of the time. Yeah. So I had some shocking moments. Some of my favorite surprises of these shows uh, worse was seeing anti manifesto twice, seeing apparently I'm a PC fascist because I care about non human animals once in Guelph, which was completely shocking to me. I was not expecting that in the slightest. Um, seeing Robin, the metal sweeper, do his <laughs> marvelous dreadlock head banging was really amazing. Um, and then I think that my favorite moment at the Lee's show in Toronto was seeing the song Potemkin City Limits. So, you know, those are a couple of my my favorite memories of those shows that kind of just linger with me so far, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there are so many. I mean, to list a few, um, Mall Crimes, the opening yes. band, MVLL Crimes, um, the ones who crime at the mall, as it were. Yeah. Um, they just absolutely slayed Mm-hmm. the latter two nights in London and, and Guelph. Um, yeah. Maldita gets a shout out as well, along with Fruits and Make War. But um, Mall Crimes really has something unbelievable going on. And um, everyone should check them out. I think they just released uh, a new EP or, or record of some kind like the other day. So do it because they're great. They're so um, Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I had a really great moment at the London show, actually, um, where uh, we were all standing kind of near the pit. It's my favorite spot in any show to be because you can have a good sight line of the show um, and then pop into the pit if you want to rage a bit. And, um, you know, I was just doing my thing, jamming out, and uh, I got a tap on the shoulder from this fellow named, what I learned later, his name was Serge, um, who just kindly asked me to move over um, because it was his nephew's first prop show. And, you know, uh, 
yeah, I was in the way. I said, no problem. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how old um, Serge's nephew was, but I, the, the look on their face as like, cop just out of frame and comply resist were were going on it was really fantastic to see the joy and the face melting happen on this on this this new nascent punk uh it actually it, it really warmed my heart and serge was a great guy and I, I had to give props to that um his nephew because um both of those people really rock yeah. really really rock nice um i was shocked as well about the sound quality at london music hall um it everything was so clear in that room and what was really fantastic about seeing propaganda there how good the room sounded was that i knew that two weeks later i was going back for protest the hero and that was like this room sounds perfect, which is the exact kind of room you need when you see a protest the hero show because so much is going on that you want to be able to hear all the complexity behind what they do. So I actually just went last weekend and saw protest the hero in the exact same room, and it sounded just as good as the propaganda show. Oh, that's awesome! I mean, the boys in protest are the guys who brought got me into prop in a way. I mean, if I like a band, I go and check out who inspired them because I figure, you know. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So um, we, uh, I mean, ever since I was big into protest in high school, um, I, I walked over, checked out prop, and um, the rest is history. Nice. Well, uh, Stephen, you mentioned earlier uh, when you were introducing yourself that you did the cover for our Night Letters episode, which is... A, a phenomenal cover. And if anybody hasn't heard that, you can, it's on episode 69 um, with Sulan Hago and Parker Malloy on that episode as well. But we're going to do a, something special for this, for this bonus episode. We're going to do a track one special and we're going to discuss night letters and note to self. And we're going to play both of the covers that you have made for these songs, totally different covers. You've done something completely different on both of them. And so Let's start with Night Letters because it's the first one that you did for the podcast. And what we're going to do here is we're going to play the cover and then you and I are going to talk about it. So here is your cover of Night Letters that you made for episode 69 of Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda.
Okay, so Stephen, I want to hear the story from your mouth about the creation of that fantastic Night Letters cover. Just we'll we'll talk about like the the band's like composition and stuff in a little bit. I'm just curious what the story behind this cover from you, and then we'll dissect the song. Yeah, I mean, um, it was late 2021, um, around I guess New Year's, Christmas time kind of thing, and um scrolling through you know instagram or whatever and all I, all of a sudden i see you posting hey somebody make a cover for an episode of ours i'm like yeah sure i'm in i just like that's it sure let's do it you know i, I really I, I owe these guys after all this amazing um just content and material you guys have done um so i uh i messaged you and i said yeah sure what's the song and then you immediately responded night letters and i proceeded to change my pants um because that's arguably one of the hardest songs if not the hardest song to play in their entire discography mm -hmm. um but you know i took it as a maybe a message from the universe to get you know better at my various instruments <laughs> and um dove right in um and I can't believe I busted it out in two weeks. It basically everything else in my um, life that wasn't work went on hold while wow. I just shedded every night um, for two weeks straight on bass and guitar. Um, and then I had to do the whole drum track, which was um, intense, uh, basically combing through live videos, different angles of Jord playing um, because I needed to see exactly what he's hitting and where. Um, doing this weird air drum in in the jam space here while I'm trying to figure out, you know, where he's throwing his stick and which symbol he's hitting so I could program these um, that drum part um, so I could play to it. It was uh, it was pretty rigorous. It's got to be said. Nice. What uh, what kind of programming did you do for the drum set? Like, do you have like a software that you that you use for that to make it? Yeah, ever since, um, man, we've been doing stuff in high school, me and me and the fellas who I'm in always bands with, me and my boys, um, we, uh, we use Guitar Pro. Um, it's a pretty well-known software for kind of tab tabbing and composing music, um, especially around guitar and drums in a rock band setting. Um, and uh, we, I mean, I've used it for so long, but the beautiful thing of it is that you can program in drums, um, into a proper drum notation, not unlike the Sheet Happens books, which I believe they do use Guitar Pro to lay out the music for. And um, what you then do is you can actually export that file as a MIDI file. And then basically it's all ready to go with all the tempos, all the changes, all the little bits and bobs. And then you just throw it in a uh, an audio workstation with a little kind of programmed drum kit um, instrument as it were mm -hmm. and then the program will just play the drums exactly the way you set them up uh so that's how that's how we did that nice very good well i am super curious about this particular song and i just want to learn about the song more you know what i mean so whenever i was like telling you to to put together some some ideas about this song, I was like, tell me about this song in as much minutia and detail as you can possibly muster. And just explain to me why this song is so special and interesting. And, you know, tell me about some of the things that I, as somebody who doesn't really perform music other than my, you know, random drum sets evenings, um, what, what would I miss? Like, what do I miss about a song like this by not understanding and studying music so that's kind of what i'm curious about and i'm just kind of interested to see what direction you take this but we can talk about anything specifically like if you have specific thoughts on guitars bass drums vocal performance like recording i don't care anything i'm just curious to hear what it is about night letters that is special in your view um i mean it's it's a pretty special song um in the sense that, I mean, there's the obvious kind of more um, non-musical minutia of the only Todd song to open a record, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a lot of little things like that. But musically, 
And one of the main things that really interested me when I first kind of picked up the um, supporting cast tab book from Sheet Happens, I'm not paid. It's just the best way to learn a propaganda song, if you're asking mm -hmm. me. And <laughs> uh, I opened it up. Night Letters is the first song. And I see this this really weird tuning. Um, and you called it Drop C on mm -hmm. the Night Letters episode, which I then, I think the, like, I love the, the day... Note. Yeah, explain this. <laughs> the day you um, posted that episode, I listened to it. Um, and I heard you talking about Drop C. And, you know, you're kind of right in that comment, but you're also, it doesn't really get to the full weirdness of this tuning. Um, to me, from what I always heard um, about tunings and the way I frame my mind around it is that you have a standard tuning. Standard tuning is what most people would know as like E standard. So E, right. A, D, G, B, E are the, you know, from low to high strings, those, those are what you'll get. Um, as of late, ever since uh, I believe supporting cast, uh, all of prop stuff has now been in standard, but tuned one half step down, which you could call like E flat standard or something like that. So it's essentially the same intervals between strings, you know, but everything's down one half step. Mm -hmm. The next kind of interesting thing about tuning is that you can then do what's called a drop tuning. And that's when you normally drop the lowest string of your instrument and you bring it down to a note, you know. Um, but when most people say drop D, that's a very classic one in punk. Um, it's basically you're in E standard tuning and you pull your low string down to a D. Propagandi does this, but they do it in in flats. So it's just like, you know, um, it's, it's drop D, but you've already tuned down to flats. That's the way I think about it. When you say drop C, normally that indicates that um, you're kind of like working within a drop D framework where you drop that whole step on your low string. Um, in standard, it would be from E to D. And then in um, on a kind of more a drop C spot, it would already be at D and then you drop it down to a C. So you would be in D standard, which is just a standard tuning, and then you drop it down to a C. That doesn't really get at what Night Letters' is tuning is because they actually drop from flats down one step and then a little bit more to another half step. So it's drop one and a half steps. And that seems a bit jargony and stuff, but really all you need to know is what Todd said at those propaganda shows. Um, <laughs> we're tuning down so we can get heavier. Yeah. And now we're going to tune down a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the cool thing about these drop tunings, like drop D or this drop one and a half step, is that it changes the way the relationship between your lowest string and your second lowest string is. You end up with this weird way that you would you could play a chord that you can't normally do um and that's the really cool part about this song just first and foremost is that when you play what would ostensibly be a power chord in a standard kind of like normal drop d tuning you don't get a power chord you get something more dissonant and um a little bit ethereal um it's just, it, it really is what makes that kind of walking through the snow on the top of a mountain vibe that everyone talked about in the Night Letters episode yeah. of your podcast. It, it, it has a level of dissonance that isn't present in a power chord, which is a much more consonant, simple, quote unquote, simple chord. Gotcha. So um, first off the tuning, that's basically that. Um, yeah. Another interesting thing about this tuning in general, the, in how it relates to the rest of the songs across the catalog, I went and looked, as far as I can find, there are four other songs with this tuning. Hey everybody, it's Steven here from the future. I was listening to the supporting cast demos the other day um, after recording this episode with Greg, and I found that The Days You Hate Yourself, um, which was a bonus track on Failed States, but also appears on the supporting cast demos with minimal lyric content, is also most likely in this strange tuning. It has a lot of similar riffs to Rattan Kane, which are 
very interesting. I would like to know more about Rattan Kane and The Days You Hate Yourself in terms of the writing process and how those riffs ended up coming together. All right. Otherwise, back to the interview. Really? And that's it. And the cool thing is four of the five total songs are Todd songs. Okay. Um, the other three Todd songs that have this tuning are Rattan Kane, Dark Matters, and This Is Your Life. Nice. So all the pretty heavy Todd bangers, if you'd ask me. I mean, yeah. Dark Matters is pretty proggy. Um, granted, so is Rattan Kane. I love Dark Matters, um, but... too. That's an overlooked song, I think. Oh, definitely. I mean, what Keith said, the last four songs, uh, and then if you even throw Cognitive Suicide in there, on fa failed states. I don't know if I do need much more music in my life beyond those, you know? It's mm. uh it's incredible that how that album just screams into a landing from the halfway point. Yeah. Um but then there is one more outlier. Um and that is the title track of the most recent album, Victory Lap. Huh. It's funny because I've been playing around with Dark Matters and Rattan Kane just on and off for so long before Victory Lap came out. As soon as they dropped that single, I heard that lone note, you know, that starts like a, you know, a you, yeah. you may scat it if you so wish. Da -da 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 -da. Yes. Um, it's, I, I said for sure, that's in that weird tuning. It's the only, I mean, granted, they're the only band I've ever seen use it. So um, it was already leaning that way, but um it lets you get that low C note just, and you rip it so hard. It sounds just deep and, and intense. Um, and uh, I believe uh, I'm, I'm speculating a bit here on the comply resist episode of uh, Chris's Patreon. He's uh, describing how the writing process for victory lap, the album went and it was, he said it was tough. They were in like a big writer's block rut. Nothing seemed to be working. And he basically just picked up his guitar after jamming out on some song or a riff and um, said to Jord, I'm going to play you a riff. It's, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be a song. It may not be released, but that's it. Yeah. And he said he came up with this almost infantile, quote unquote, infantile riff. I'm pretty sure that that's the riff to Victory Lap. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it's very in what we, what guitarists call in the box. It's very, it just sits on very key tones in a, in a minor pentatonic scale. And it just, it rips on it and it sounds great. But at the same time, someone who's like really into the minutia of like, well, I want to try this cool scale or, or this cool chord, like minor pentatonics kind of like, you almost kind of frown upon it sometimes because it's mm. just too easy to make something sound good. Yeah. Um, so I could definitely see that kind of caveman opening victory lap riff being uh, <laughs> that riff that he's referencing nice. in that episode. Nice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this song, Night Letters, which we're talking about, is, is really special for a lot of reasons. And I just kind of wanted to go start to finish through the song yeah. uh, and, and just kind of explain why this song really works the way it does from a musical standpoint but also from a musical lyrical thematic standpoint um i think you know both of these songs that we're talking about today really exemplify um writing music that complements lyric as well as uh, a theme i think they really meld sometimes you end up with a song it's just a punk song and they're singing about you know how voting is is completely unreal like resistance. the state lottery oh yeah and resistance and you know uh, or you know don't don't eat meat and you know what all of those things are very valid but these two songs really i think the reason why they they end up being kind of quote unquote fives for you guys is yeah. that they really embody what they want to say in every facet of their being and uh night letters is no exception so um We'll get some kind of boring stuff out of the way. Sure. Um, this song is in uh, <clears throat> C minor. And uh, people who read the Sheet Happens tablature will probably say, no, nah, but it's in G minor. The Sheet Happens tablature is strictly wrong. Um, I have nothing else to say. Fight me. 
um, Luke and Tim or whoever tab that <laughs> song out um, because you guys are wrong. It's in C minor. And um, the cool thing, the interesting thing about that is that um, when we say C minor, um, that means that we're playing a certain scale, C minor, um, and that's what we're kind of basing the song around and all our chords around and stuff like that. It's just a shorthand so that people who are reading the music again or to communicate with people you're playing with, yeah, like if you play around that scale, you'll probably sound pretty good. Yeah. Um, but minor tonality is something that we in the Western sphere of music associate with like a sadness. You know, you'll always hear it's like, oh, it's like, that's a sad song. Generally, it's probably if it sounds tonally sad, you're probably playing in some kind of minor key or minor scale. Yeah, it's like whenever you see those like YouTube videos of somebody who like modifies something like smells like Teen Spirit into a major chord. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? And then yeah. it totally changes the entire vibe of the song if you just play it in a major instead of a minor. Yeah, basically you're choosing these um, tonal notes that are totally um, different contextually to our brains after listening to music for so long in a Western standpoint. It's just we know we hear a minor chord. It's like, yep. I should feel sad now because that's yeah. just the vibe. Um, and I mean, yeah, a minor key, minor scale just makes sense for this song. I mean, um, it's not exactly talking about roses and daisies, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that just already, I mean, it's a pretty simple thematic uh, thing, but we already see that happening. Um so if we just start on that opening chord, um, not even the opening riff, but the opening chord, that swell that comes in, yeah, um, it's not tabbed anywhere uh, on the Sheet Happens paperwork, which is interesting. So I had to kind of do the live video search. Um, and it looks like that the chord is uh, kind of a minor sixth chord. Mm -hmm. So you're playing all the stuff that you normally play for just a standard minor triad based chord, which is the root, the minor third, and then the fifth of the scale. Um, but then you're also playing, you're adding on a little note that we call the minor six. Um, it's called that because in a minor scale, that is the sixth note. Um, it's as simple as that. And it's basically just really pulling that tonality in and saying, yeah, this is going to be a bleak, a sad, you know, a, you know, that's how it's going to be. And that's that I believe the quote unquote fucked up chord that um, Sulin and so many other people talk about when they talk about the opening of this song. Yeah. Um, it's got this like just an intense, snowy, sour, bleak um, feeling to it that just totally sucks you in. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first time I heard that chord, um, I just immediately uh, was drawn into the song and just couldn't. I was hooked. <laughs> same, same for me. Same. I remember the first time I ever heard it. And I was like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. If you really dive into the full swell chord, um, Chris, when he plays it, um, I believe it's Chris. Um, he plays it live. So he lets more than just kind of the main tonal notes sing. This chord actually pops up later on in the song quite a bit. Um, but he kind of just lets every string ring out no matter what fret he's pressing. And you get these just extra dissonances piling on top of each other. I've written them out. Um, so between the first two notes, the interval is a minor sixth interval. Then we have a major seventh interval, which you would say, well, that would normally sound pretty happy. Um, but the major seventh is classically one of the most dissonant sounds in the Western tonality. Hmm. Um, you know, probably only the tritone is is less so, or the minor second, um, minor flat second. Excuse me, put my my little music glass nerd, <laughs> push them up. Um, but yeah, it's it's classically dissonant because it wants to pull onto the root of the of the scale so hard that you just feel so tense. And yeah. that's really a good way to describe this chord. It's tense. It's built on tension on tension. So I'm just going to list them out really quick, rapid fire. It's a minor six on top of a major seventh on top of a fifth, which is pretty consonant, but still pretty, it pulls, it's tense. Um, and then we have the minor second, and then on top of a nice little unison to round it out. It's, it really exemplifies the tension this song 
exudes all the time. You know, you're torn between, you know, this life and the one left behind mm -hmm. constantly. Um, and that's really what this song is just doing all the time. Um, it's almost a thesis. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, then we have what I like to call um, the stomp chord, which is what you would normally consider to be a power chord. Um, but when they hit that, that extra half step on the drop tuning um, changes it into what I've noted as a minor six flat nine chord, mm -hmm. which the flat nine is incredibly dissonant, as I just said. Um, and the minor six is, yeah, pretty dissonant, um, but, you know, more exemplifies kind of like we're in a minor tonality. It's sad. Um, and that chord is equally as fucked up as the swell chord, if you ask me. It's you're expecting this, you know, yeah, just like a strong power chord back to the motor league let's go yeah but it's it's so much more heavy and plodding and just it's everything this song is <laughs> right really those two chords are just night letters i think yeah um you know and then as we go through this intro um the interesting thing is that we move around that stomp chord by going into that power chord and then into the the chug you know the mm -hmm. if i may i just have to retune here's an example maybe we'll cut this out but <laughs> um <laughs> maybe on. i won't maybe you won't um let me see how quickly i can tune it and that'll that'll tell us okay <laughs> okay okay so if i may i'll kind of show what's happening in a more condensed um, space. So we have the stomp chord, which is, and then we jump up to this power chord. The cool thing that I find about this is, is that the power chord that we're playing right now is just the stomp chord. If you weren't playing in that drop one and a half step tuning. So you end up where you could play it like this. And that's the same riff, but it just doesn't do that big low to high jump. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, but then it's even more interesting because then we jumped around to the chug, you know, that. Yeah. If you watch that way that that root note jumps around, we would play on the low string if everything was beside each other. And the interesting thing is about that is that that those are just the first three notes of the minor scale that we're playing in. I know it's crazy. Yeah, and um, it just it, it really the, propagandi does this a lot, where they'll move one or two notes in a chord, and they'll be outlining a melody while they're playing this chord, um, and that's what's happening in this first riff, um, you know, on that main meat and potatoes of the riff. Yeah. Um, then, of course, you know, we have that shrill arpeggio that Chris is playing. Um, that's just the swell chord. That It's the same chord. And instead of, you know, in one piece, we hear it kind of segmented um, and picked, um, which is just what an arpeggio is. You're playing a chord, but just one note at a time. Um, sometimes you let them blend together. Sometimes you don't. Um, and it's just... It's perfect. What more is there to say about this intro? Yeah. It's uh, it's exactly what it needs to be. But we come out of that pretty quickly into what I've just labeled as the fast bit. Um, you know, we got a lot of of descending riffage happening here, um, and it's really what I find the song revolves around. Um, you know, there's a lot of fast time signature changes. Um, you know, we jump from if I look at the tab here, we're jumping from uh, just absolutely wild stuff. So we go from 4-4 four, four to 7-8, back to 4-4. Four, four. Uh, then we play you know, a lot of the same stuff over again, but we're adding and dropping a beat here and there to the point where it, it really adds to this kind of frenetic, frantic vibe that the song has. And you end up with... Um, I what I like to see almost as kind of the world blowing right apart before Todd even mentions it, you know, 
you already saw it happen. You just didn't even realize it happened right under your nose. Um, if you're just some random person listening to the song for the first time. Um, and that's really what I think makes those lyrics hit so hard. It's like, well, yeah, they, it did. I just saw my world blow right apart. What happened? Um, it's, it really, I mean, you guys talked about it so much in your episode, but it just really draws you in perfectly. It just couldn't be, <laughs> couldn't be better. Um, you know, we're moving a around with a lot of weird chords. Um, well, there's a lot of power chords happening, but we also have some um, really cool, what I've labeled as minor seven suspended fourth chords um, with a little added high third there. So they have a lot of tension in them, um, suspended chords, because um, a suspended chord, whether it's the fourth or a second that's suspended, um, you're taking the third and you're basically removing it and you're replacing it with one of these other two notes, which are right beside it. Generally, when a note is beside another note, if the other note is quote unquote stronger to our Western ear, we have this pull to want to hear it. That's kind of like what I was explaining with that major seventh. Um, it's right beside the octave or the root of the note of the scale. So you really want to go to it um, to the point where that note is actually called the leading tone. There's your word bird for the day. Um, nice. And uh, the suspended fourths and seconds in, in chords, if there is one, they do the same thing. They really pull you back to the third. Um, and that creates tension. So you have this constant, just never ending tension in this song that never goes away because, I mean, thematically in the song, it never does. You know, um, you're just, you're completely unsettled the entire time. Um, and this is a good point to start, you know, at, um, point out something that happens a lot in propaganda songs, which is um, you get dyad chords, which uh, that's what I call them. I don't know if that's really the case. Some people call them just intervals, but you're basically just playing two notes at the same time, um, like a chord, but some snooty music people frown upon it when you call it a chord. Some people are like, you have to have three notes in a chord or it's not a chord, it's an interval. I just call them dyad chords. You're playing two notes. And that's it. Um, they do it all the time. Um, you know, you hear it all over from the beginning of the catalog. They have the, these kinds of, of chords in, uh, in like stick the flag up your ass. And, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's just been kind of like the, just the way they write. Um, it's a good way to kind of bridge melody and harmony together. And we'll talk a lot about that in Note to Self. Note to Self is basically dyads the song. <laughs> but we'll get to that later. Nice. Um, and, and what, I mean, what else is there to say besides Jord is an absolute monster. You know, yeah. he's playing those blast beats. Um, as a young metalhead in high school, when I first heard this song, uh, it was everything I needed to know that this band was the best band on the planet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Jord is just... He's a force of nature and the way he plays is completely idiosyncratic to the point that he, there's no other drummer like Jord. And you've said it countless times on the podcast, Dude, but it can't be hammered home enough. I like, so like whenever I go downstairs in my basement and I play my drum, sometimes I'll put on like less talk, more rock. And I'll try to play along to apparently I'm a PC fascist, which sounds like it would be easy if you know how to play drums. But like, I find myself just, off on the beat and i'm like i'm not playing it like him i feel like i should be nailing this but i'm just completely off with him and i don't get it i don't understand why but like you but no one plays like him and so playing along with his stuff is extremely difficult even when it's a song that feels like it should be easy totally um there's just something in the water that that you're drank <laughs> and yeah. uh it's it's completely unique and yeah. i mean you see that just no matter what song you listen to george drummond is unreal yeah so question um you just mentioned all of these extremely technical things and clearly you know a lot about you know music in general from your years of you know playing and studying music and thinking about music and writing music but i'm wondering if you learned anything new 
by forcing yourself to go all the way through night letters. And I'm wondering if like you had any moments where you're like, wow, that's kind of the first time I've ever done that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was dexterity based. I mean, mm -hmm. the way that Todd specifically wrote this song is um, completely like it, it almost like it felt like my hand was like learning how to move again. <laughs> yeah. um, it's kind of funny because I think Beave was talking about how yeah. the big riff um, in the song is was so troubling for him because it really had to lock together and the timing with his left hand and his right hand was so important. Um, for me, um, the courting, which I think B probably had a really easy time. Anyone who listened to Giant Sons or Agassiz right. or, I mean, Failed States and Supporting Cast just knows that the way he can play a chord is he's got it down pat. But for me, it was the opposite. I mean, the big riff was pretty easy, but uh, as a metalhead playing metal for the longest time, but right. um, that those chords were just, they're, they're alien chords. There's no other way to say it. Um, Todd picks chords that are like not of this planet. Mm. Like not even Voivod plays chords that are that alien. Um, they are just wild. The notes he chooses and where to place them and the way his hand moves is unlike anything I've ever really seen on guitar. And um, that was the real challenge for me. Um, one, playing guitar to the level of a propagandi song, which is not something yeah. I've ever really strive to do um in any level of seriousness before this um but then on top of that learning these very strange chords that that todd is picking out and um the way he puts his fingers on the on the neck are just another level i love it well steven do you want to uh should we change gears a little bit and swap over to note to self yeah i mean that sounds good sounds we good basically to me. um we got notes to self here, and this one is just in flat standard, um, so a lot more simple. But before we get into that, we should hear your cover, right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess let's so. do that. So, Stephen, you did a second cover uh, for Note to Self, which I am delighted that we get to feature here because it's very different than the first one that you did for Night Letters uh, in the fact that it is an acoustic cover. So let's go ahead and hear your cover of Note to Self, and then we'll have a chat about it and then the song. Sat there, believing in this 
All right. So, Stephen, that was your note to self cover, and it is wonderful. I listened to it three, four times today. And I, I was chatting about it a little bit with Jamie, and Jamie was like, it's so good. So <laughs> tell me the story of your journey through creating this cover for Note to Self and some of the choices you made along the way and kind of like what's interesting about this story of creating this cover for you. Well, um, I mean, obviously, the first choice was that I wanted to kind of do it uh, almost like acoustic. Um, you know, the Night Letters cover was so quick. Um, on the on the trigger that we had to, I mean, in my opinion, just do the song verbatim, get it done. Um, but here I had a little bit more time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do and, um, you know, change it up a little bit. And acoustic really screamed at me because of just the way this song kind of really sounds. It really focuses on a lot of little single picked riffs and stuff like that. Um, not unlike Last Will and Testament, um, which I know you find are, are these two songs are almost intrinsically related to you yeah. and um so you know i basically noodled on the acoustic until i realized that um i had a week <laughs> and yeah. i hadn't really made any recording ground so i ended up doing the song almost verbatim but in this acoustic style which i found interesting because i wouldn't have approached it that way if i wasn't crunched for time um but it really made a lot of stuff stand out. Um, specifically, how this song is almost like, if if it was so presented to you that way, it would almost be like a classical guitar piece. Mm. It sounds almost like it belongs on a nylon string guitar um, with these nice dyad chords moving around and outlining these harmonies that Chris is singing. And uh, really it really comes to shine that way, especially in the dazed numb bit, that harmony bit in the yes. song already is incredibly, um, you know, wonderful and. dark but it really comes to show when you play it on the acoustic i can even send you a solo snippet of that chunk of the song I would love um, it. without the vocal on top yeah and it do. really it really sounds just crazy um just like a classical guitar piece i, I don't really know how else to say it something like steve howe would play on a solo record for Amazing. <laughs> when he's not playing for yes um and uh yeah, it was an interesting thing because um, I don't play a lot of acoustic. I use it more for writing um, because you don't have to plug in and it, this, the ideas you come up with are a little bit more, um, they're unsullied by distortion and stuff like that. So you can sure. really just get to the idea of what you're writing. But um, it was interesting to play something on the acoustic that way because um, it really also showed how intricate these parts can be, quite simply. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's chat about the song itself, and I, I kind of wanted to have you just explain this song again in in your view, uh, kind of like what you just did for Night Letters, like where we just kind of take it incrementally. But you know, I'm curious about anything related to guitar, bass, drums, vocal delivery that stand out, but also some things like effects if there's anything in in that that stands out to you uh anything that 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 you feel like is interesting to share um please do well um we can start kind of um almost before note to self um with just kind of like the outro of last will yeah. i took a quick look um and there wasn't really much um tonally connecting them um beyond the fact that there was this like fed back note that kind of fades out and then almost fades back in as you've noted so many times yeah um when you've spoken about note to self uh but the one thing that i did note that was pretty cool is that the key that last will and testament is is in is a brighter key than um what note to self is in by a couple points 
Um, and what's interesting about that is that makes by proxy note to self a darker sound. Um, basically, it just doesn't have as many kind of lifted notes in the scale. Mm -hmm. And that basically makes it just sound what, you know, colloquially is known as a, a darker sound, which yeah. thematically, again, just just fits. <laughs> yeah. Because if you want to talk about those two songs, I mean, Last Will and Testament has a bit more kind of like, yes, we can, what are you going to do? We can do it. Um, uh, vibe to it. But note to self, you know, what what didn't I do is more kind of, and what, what will I do now that I haven't done so many things? Um, and that just fits so thematically. Um, a lot of the effect stuff, though, since you're you're so curious about that, happens really exemplified in the beginning of the song, starting with the lead-in note. Again, you get this swelling fit, fed back note that uh, is played with an ebo, mm -hmm. um, and that the name of that effect is quite simple. It's an electronic bow, not unlike what you would use on a violin. Sure. Um, you just hold it above a string and it has a little magnet in it that makes the string vibrate um, the way a bow makes a string vibrate on a violin. So you can play the guitar like a violin or a cello of some kind. Um, and that's, you get this kind of infinite sustain song uh, sound when you play with an ebo like that. Um, so that's what that Ebo note is for anyone who's curious. Um, and then we have another note in the tablature for anyone following along that says, uh, the trem bar, you gotta you know, use that whammy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the interesting about that is not a trem bar. Everyone kind of knows what a whammy bar is. You know, Joe Rico does his dive bombs and sacrifice yeah. or whatever. Uh, but, uh, specifically Beeves is a Bigsby trem system, which, um, you know, some guitarists will be like, ah, not a Bigsby. Um, Bigsby's are famous for kind of really messing up your tuning when you use them sometimes. Mm. Um, they don't really hold tuning as well as um, other tremolo systems. But um, Beeves trem on this song is is a Bigsby specifically. Um, yeah. He played with one pretty much his whole time, I think, in, in Propagandi. And um, you can see, anyone who wants to pull up a picture can see that there's a really long section of string just behind um, the last pickup of the guitar, mm -hmm. um, just off the bridge. And um, that piano sound at the beginning, um, what Keith called the piano sound, um, and he's not far off. I thought it was a piano for the longest time. It's Beave is actually picking on that section of the guitar. He's just plucking it. And it makes this really tight sound because that part of the guitar is just wound so tight um, that it ends up sounding like a piano when you throw some distortion on it. It's just a really, really cool sound. Nice. Um, we also end up with, um, you know, uh, Beeve using a lot of delay um, in the call response bit. And I really, I mean, in the tab, Chris isn't playing anything for about a minute. <laughs> yeah. um, it's all Beave and his delay just responding back to him. Um, just kind of alone in this, um, I mean, I guess like this echo <laughs> chamber, as it yeah. were. And, uh, you know, then Todd comes in and he's playing these fantastic um, little runs and, and harmonies with the guitar. Um, Todd gets away with murder. And that's something that's actually a term of endearment among bassists and musicians in general, but especially bassists. Um, normally, we're relegated to the back. You know, you're just playing with the guitar and really thickening up that sound, you know. But every once in a while, you'll come across a bassist who can just play almost anything they want on top of a song, and it sounds amazing. And Todd is just one of those guys who can just get away with murder just nice he, he's not playing he's not doing what everyone's supposed to do and it doesn't matter he, yeah he's just a wild man um nice. the really cool part about this song from a non-effect standpoint is that it generates a different kind of tension um almost a, a bleakness by not really telling you what whether you're supposed to feel 
up or down, happy or sad. It really plays between the major and the minor sound a lot. Um, every harmony, every chord is is either major or minor, and you'll jump between them. Um, a, a really great example of that is um, the uh, the transition riff in between uh, the how does it make you feel to know you just stood by and watched it right. um, line. You just sat there believing in this bullshit system. Just wishing the mob would magically come to its senses. How does it make you feel to know you just stood by and watched it? That, those chords switch every time between major, minor, minor, major, to the point where you don't know where you land. And the, the, the chord where it does land on has that kind of similar tension we were talking about in Night Letters, where it really wants to go somewhere. It really wants to go to the root of, of the scale, um, which a lot of musicians would call the home of the scale and um you don't get that the first time around they play that um in a smaller form earlier in the song um but then when you come out of the dazed numb bit uh you you get the frantically clicking our heels already home line and where you land when chris sings home is the root of the entire song that's where you are and not only is it thematically important but it's also musically important because now instead of being confused as to whether we're in a major or a minor sound the rest of the song is pretty firmly minor bleak um dark i have i've wrote i think i've written down spiral <laughs> um and it's monotonous um, it's, it's everything you feel when you're in a dark abyss of self-loathing and, um, you know, I guess as Todd put it in the liner notes, lazy, um, you know, you're just sitting there watching your bands, watching your sports and drinking your booze. Um, and the rest of the song just sits in that minor tonality all the way to the end where, um, while it is bleak, um, we're still going to rage and rage hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one more fun thing that I, I think is really apt in this song. I don't think it was intentional. Um, but, um, the time signatures in this song are pretty straightforward. You're playing in either, you know, four, four, maybe a little bit of five, four in the days, the numb bit, but then after you frantically click your heels already home. Um, you're in three, four time the rest of the way. And the reason I find that so interesting uh, or noteworthy is that, I don't know if you remember, Greg, I'm just going to do a quick quiz for you. How many times must you click your ruby red slippers to get home? Three? Three times. And isn't thank, it thank goodness just I so... Thank that correct. But it's just so weird. But I mean... It's, ser it's almost serendipitous, but maybe it's on purpose that the rest of this time you're, you're counting every bar, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's like you're constantly clicking your heels, hoping that you're going to be somewhere anywhere else wow. than where you are, you know, Nicely said. and you know, when you're in a dark place, whether it's, you know, because you're fed up with the world or, you know, or something personal happened to you and you start really retreating inward, you want to, you, you do kind of this clicking thing in your head and you're like, come on, this is not where I'm at. Right. It can't be. Um, I've been there and I'm sure other people have been, but you, you already, you know, you'll look around and you'll still find out that you're home and the, all that's left is what you see around you. Right. 
um, it's so it fits so well that I it just feels like it has to be planned. <laughs> but I can't speak for whether or not that's true. So another question I have for you about this particular one is just if you can tell me about the the outro, the the heavy stuff, the the metal sweeper part. Um, the metal sweeper. Rob yeah. Robin just lets lets the hair down and lets her go. Tell me about that because you you tran you you kind of like uh translated it nicely on the acoustic version and I wonder if you have any particular thoughts about that last outro part. Yeah, I mean in that bit you're basically just rocking on the minor scale, um, ton tonally wise. And um, I found it really interesting because if you played it kind of more from a normal position that you would on an acoustic guitar, you end up really just being able to dig in really hard. And um, when you do that on an acoustic guitar, it's like you got a distortion pedal, like the mm -hmm. strings just start ringing out against each other. And I thought that that was a pretty cool way of bringing that energy up for that portion of the song um when i didn't have any form of you know kind of distortion crutch as guitarists are wont to do <laughs> um and it really kind of gave me this almost like folk angry folk vibe you know when someone's just really pissed uh yeah. and he's just just going um so i just i just basically ended up leaning on it like that um, not to keep harping on this three clicks in your home kind of thing, but if you really kind of look at the way that that last bit is structured, it repeats itself changing every time, but it repeats itself thrice. Mm -hmm. And where do you land at the end of that song? Right at home. <laughs> Just, you know, ba, 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 and that's it. You're done. Um, not to steal your your scatting privileges here, but um... no, I love it. I <laughs> whenever whenever somebody on the show does something that I don't have to do, it makes me very very happy. So I appreciate the uh, the the release from the scatting privileges, uh, even if only temporarily. <laughs> um, well, Stephen, I have learned a lot, and you know these are a couple ep recent episodes that we've done. And your vividness and your description of what is happening musically really, I feel, complements those episodes very well in a way that because like Keith and I get into a lot more of like the, the ideas and the current events behind what is happening in a song and the things that are happening in the world that the song makes us think about. And this is like a, a switch for me, like a really nice change of pace where we focus more on what the performance itself brings to what the song is teaching about and, you know, how atmosphere and tone can complement the lesson of a song and how it can make it have a, a more effective impact on the listener. Um, and that, that's what I feel like your stories have done today and your analysis and assessment of what the uh, what the band is doing in these tunes so i'm i'm really grateful to you um for for taking the time to do this with me and for making these two magnificent covers uh i'm wondering if there is a place that you would direct listeners if they want to get in touch or if there is you know maybe a possibility of like a digital release of these couple of covers in the future or anything like that, like outside the podcast. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you want to, to share with the folks out there listening. Um, if anyone wants to find me, I don't post incredibly often, um, but I am on Instagram. Uh, I am bassist, uh, but uh, it is spelled B A five, five H I S T. And um uh, you know, I post some stuff on the stories sometimes, uh, you know, it's nothing too intense, but, uh, if you are looking to get in touch, feel free anytime to just shoot me a DM. Um, you know, there are various other spots that you can go from there to look for past musical projects. And I'm sure I'll be posting about future, future musical projects there. Um, probably not too far from now. So nice. it'll all be, it'll all be there. Nice. Cool. Um, well, Stephen, I, I, I hope that maybe before this podcast runs out of tunes, maybe we can do another song with you uh, down the road if you're 
if you're up for it. I'm gonna get, I'm not gonna ask for a while um, because <laughs> you you put your heart and soul into these couple of covers that you've made for us, and I'm not gonna abuse that uh, that energy um, with you. So, but hopefully in the future we can do this again and uh, chat about another tune. Yeah, I think completing the trifecta would be a pretty good idea. Yeah, well, Stephen Yerushi, thank you so much for joining me and for being a pal and going to see three propaganda shows with me and for that fabulous lunch at Copper Branch and all those great things that we did when we hung out. So it has been a real joy, um, you know, chatting over the last couple of years, but then also hanging in, hanging for real and uh, enjoying our are enjoying our time in Southern Ontario and this great chat today. So thank you so much for, for doing this with me. Man, I have nothing better to say other than thank you guys. And uh, yeah, um, keep on rocking.